Howdy folks, it's Howie here, <clears throat> Howie the Cat, and we're going to do chapter two of Understanding Comics. I'm going to try and get into this as fast as I can. It's going to be a longer video again, so I don't want to do that to you fine folks. Chapter two, the vocabulary of comics. So we're going to learn more about the vocabulary of comics. There's a painting by Marjorie called Treachery of Images. The Treachery of Images. The inscription in French translated, it means this is not a pipe. And indeed, this is not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe. Um, and we can see on page 216 there's going to be more with this pipe. But, right? Well, actually, that's wrong. This is not a painting of a pipe. This is a drawing of a painting of a pipe. Niese pas? I hope... Nope. Again, it's a printed copy of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. That's up there. Ten copies, actually. Six, if you fold the pages back. Like said, yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you do, have your ears checked because no one said a word. <clears throat> it's kind of silly what we're doing, but we're learning the language of comics. When people say something to you, they don't. And when there's images and pictures, whatever, you know, they are and they aren't, and it's all kinds of stuff. So this is not a man. Let's see if I can get this up here for you. Um, you know, this is not a man. This is not a country. This is not a leaf. These are not people. These are not ideas. This is not a cow. This is not my voice. Welcome to the strange and wonderful world of the icon. This is not music. This is not sound. This is not law. This is not me. This is not a planet. This is not food. This is not a company. Poor kitchen sink press. They were a great company. This is not a face. These are not separate moments. This is not a car. And the idea we're learning what icons and comics are and why they, you know, we know what they are in life. But this is a whole different type of lesson we're we're talking about. I'm teaching the uh, language and how to understand comics. Or he is. I'm just reading it. He he taught it. Now the word icon means many things. This is paper. This is ink on paper. For the purpose of this chapter, I'm using the word icon to mean any image used to represent a person, place, thing, or idea. That's a bit broader than the definition in my dictionary, but the closest thing to what I need here. Symbol is a bit too loaded for me. The sorts of images we usually call symbols are one category of icon. However, we have anarchy and symbols. Excellent. You know, these ideas are the images we use to represent concepts, ideas, and philosophies. Then there are the icons of language, science, and communication. Icons of the practical realm. And finally, the icons we call pictures. Images designed to actually resemble their subjects. But as resemblance varies, so does the level of icon content. Or to put it somewhat clumsily, some pictures are just more iconic than others. In the non-pictorial icons, the non-pictorial icons, meaning fixed and absolute, their appearance doesn't affect their meaning because they represent individual, indivisible ideas. <coughs> In pictures, however, meaning and fluid and variable according to appearance, they differ from real life appearances to varying degrees. Words are totally abstract icons. That is, <clears throat> they bear more, no more, or they bear no resemblance at all to the real McCoy. 
See, if you put an I, that's not an I, although it represents an I. But in pictures, the level of the abstraction varies some. Like the face in the previous panel, so closely resembles the real-life counterparts as to almost trick the eye. Others, like yours truly, are quite a bit more abstract and, in fact, are very much unlike any human face you've ever seen. Let's see if we can put these pictorial icons in some sort of order. Common wisdom holds that photograph and the realistic pictures are the icons that most resemble their real-life counterparts. The, there are many things that set these apart from actual faces. They're smaller, flatter, less detailed. They don't move. They lack color. But as pictorial icons go, they're pretty realistic. I'm sorry, a little... Okay. Somewhat more abstract is this style of drawing found in many adventure comics. So we go from the almost a photograph drawing to the realistic art to comic y art. Only outlines and a hint of shading are still present, but we easily recognize this as a human face. As we continue to abstract and simplify our image, we are moving further and further from the real face of the photo. Why then is the face above so acceptable to our eyes? Why does it seem just as real as the others? What is the secret of icon we call the cartoon? I didn't even notice this each time. He's here, but each time a new guy is... Okay, that's just, just a fun side note. Why? Why are we so involved? I'm looking at different faces of the world. Why would anyone, young or old, respond to a cartoon as much or more than more than a realistic image. Realistic image, a cartoon. Why is our culture so enthralled to the simplified reality of the cartoon? <clears throat> defining the cartoon would take up as much space as defining comics. But for now, I'm going to examine cartooning as a form of amplification through simplification. When we abstract an image through cartooning, we're not so much eliminating details as we are focusing on specific details. By stripping down an image to its essential meaning, an artist can amplify that meaning in a way that can, that realistic art can't. Yeah, stripping down realistic art can't do what a cartoon can do. Film critics will sometimes describe a live-action film as cartoon to acknowledge the stripped-down intensity of a simple story or visual style. Though the term is often used despairingly, disparagingly, it cannot be equally well applied. It can be. God, I'm doing really bad. It can be equally well applied to many time-tested classics, simplifying characters and images toward a purpose can be an effective tool for storytelling in any medium. Cartooning isn't just a way of drawing. It's a way of seeing. <clears throat> the ability to, of cartoons to focus our attention on an idea is, I think, an important part of their special power, both in comics and in drawing general. <clears throat> Another is the universality of cartoon imagery. The more cartoony a face, for instance, the more people could be said to describe. This is one person, a few people, thousands of people, millions of people, basically all people. 
a little less detail. But I believe there's something more at work in our minds when we view a cartoon, especially a human face, which warrants further investigation. What are you really seeing? The fact that your mind is capable of taking a circle, two dots, and a line, and turning them into a face is nothing short of incredible. But still, more incredible is the fact that you cannot avoid seeing a face here. Your mind won't let you. It's pretty amazing. Look at that. That's two dots, a line, and a circle. You see a face. I see a face. Everybody sees a damn face. Our minds are amazing. Ask a friend to draw you some shapes on a piece of paper. They should be closed curves, but otherwise can be as weird and irregular he or she wants. Let's say the results look something like this. Now you'll find that no matter what they look like, every single one of those shapes can be made into a face with one simple addi addition. Wow. Uh, drawing an eye. Look at that. That's a face. There's a face with a big old weird nose. No, yeah, they're all kind of facey. Your mind has no trouble at all converting such shapes into faces, yet would it ever mistake this for this? We humans are a self-centered race. We see ourselves in everything. We assign identities and emotions where none exist. Well, happy. Jeez, greedy. Um, and we make the world over in our image. <clears throat> Think of your face as a mask. What's it? Uh, what is it, after all? A mask. Facing outward. Worn from the day you were born. Slave to your every mental command. Seen by everyone you meet, but never by you. Open its eyes now. Just think, it, the mask, will obey. All set? Good. Now smile. Come on, nobody's looking. Good. Now what changed when you smiled? What did you see? Nothing, right? Yet you know you smiled, not just because you felt your cheeks compress or they crinkle around your eyes. You know you smiled because you trusted this mask called your face to respond. But the face you see in your mind is not the same as others see. When two people interact, they usually look directly at one another, seeing their partner's features in vivid detail. Each one also sustains a constant awareness of his or her own face. But this mind picture is not nearly so vivid. Just sketchy arrangement and a sense of shape, sense, general placement. Something as simple and as basic as a cartoon. <laughs> Thus, when you look at a photo or a realistic drawing of a face... You see it as the face of another, but when you enter the world of cartoon, you see yourself. Don't let my whistle. I believe this is the primary cause of our childhood fascination with cartoons, though other factors such as universal identification simplification. And the childlike features of many cartoon characters also play a part. The cartoon is a vacuum into which our identity and awareness is pulled. An empty shell that we inhabit, which enables us to travel in another realm. We don't just observe the cartoon, we become it. That's why I decided to draw myself in such a simple style. Would you have listened to me if I looked like this? Looking more like he really looks. 
I doubt it. You would have been far too aware of the messenger to fully receive the message. Apart from what little I told you about myself in chapter one, I'm practically a blank slate. It would never even occur to you to wonder what my politics are, or what I had for lunch, or where I got this silly outfit. I'm just a little voice inside your head, a concept. You give me life by reading this book and by filling up this very iconic cartoony form. Who am I is irrelevant. I'm just a little piece of you. But if who I am matters less, maybe what I say will matter more. That's the theory anyway. So far, we've only discussed faces, but the phenomenon of non-visual self-awareness can, to a lesser degree, still apply to our whole bodies. After all, do we need to see our hands to know what they are doing? Her ankle is hurting. He's holding a glass. There's more, too. And the late, great Marshall McCullen uh, observed a small form of non-visual awareness when people interacted with in an inanimate objects. When driving, for example, we experience much more than our five senses report. The whole car, not just the parts we can see, feel, and hear, is very much on our minds at all times. Our vehicle becomes an extension of our body. It absorbs our sense of identity. We become the car. If one car hits another, the driver of the vehicle being struck is much more likely to say, hey, he hit me, than he hit my car, or his car hit my car, for that matter. Our identities and awareness are invested in many inanimate objects. Every day our clothes, for example, can trigger numerous transformations on the way others see us and the way we see ourselves. Our ability to extend our ability to extend our identities into inanimate objects can cause pieces of wood to become legs or pieces of metal to become hands, or pieces of plastic to become ears, pieces of glass to become eyes. And in, our, in, in every case, our constant awareness of self flows outward to include the identity, to include the object of our extended identity. And just as our awareness of our biological selves are simplified conceptual images, so too is our awareness of these extensions greatly simplified. <clears throat> All the things we experience in life can be separated into two realms, the realm of the concept and the realm of the senses. For identities, our identities belong permanently to the conceptual world. They can't be seen, heard, smelled, touched, tasted. They're merely ideas. And everything else at the start belongs to the sensual world, the world outside of us. Gradually, we reach beyond ourselves. We encounter the sight, smell, touch, taste, and sound of our own bodies and the world around us. And soon we discover that objects of the physical world can also cross over and possess identities of their own, or as our extensions begin to glow with life. We lend to them. By de-emphasizing the appearance of the physical world in favor of the idea of the form, the cartoon places itself in the world of concepts. Through traditional realism, the comics artist can portray the world without. And through the cartoon world, the world within. And when cartoons are used throughout a story, the world of that story may seem to pulse with life. 
And this is a cartoon world that's alive. He's sitting there, he's listening to music, he's having some coffee, and then we'll look into it a little better. Inanimate objects may seem to possess separate identities, so that if one jumped up and started singing, it wouldn't feel out of place. But emphasizing the concepts of an object over their physical appearance, much has to be omitted. If an artist wants to portray the beauty and complexity of the physical world, realism of some sort is going to play a part. Sorry, sorry. There we go here. When drawing the face and figure, nearly all comics artists apply at least some small measure of cartooning. Even the more realistic adventure artists are a far cry from photo realists. Storytellers in all media know. Storytellers in all media know that a sure indicator of audience involvement is to the degree to which the audience identifies with a story's character. And since viewer identification is specialty of cartooning, cartoons have historically held an advantage in breaking into world popular culture. On the other hand, no one expects audiences to identify with brick walls or landscapes, and indeed, backgrounds tend to be slightly more realistic. In some comics, this split is far more pronounced. In the Belgian clearline style of Erge's Tintin combines very iconic characters with unusually realistic backgrounds. I've never read some Tintin, but it's a really cool looking book. But this combination allows oops, my doo-doo allows readers to mask themselves in a character and safely enter a sensually stimulating world. Look at that. He's very cartoony, very realistic, very cool looking drawing there of sorts. One set of lines to see, another set of lines to be. So it is much easier to be him because he's not that distinct, not that descript. He could be you. He's in the real world. In the world of animation, where the effect happens to be practical, necessity, Disney has used it with impressive results for over 50 years. In Europe, it can be found in many popular comics, from Asterix to Tintin to Worlds of Jacques, Tar uh, Jacques Tardet. In American comics, the effect is used far less often, although it has crept up in the works of artists as diverse as Carl Barks, Jamie Hernandez, and the team of Dave Sim and Gerhard. And that's a Dave Sim Cerebus. Um, so I had, uh, Carl Barks and Dave Sim works in some of my other videos, of my collections. That's okay. That's just what I have. <laughs> in Japan, on the other hand, the masking effect was for a time virtually national style. Um, that's a, I think that's a Hiroshima. It's art is uh, art where people are cartoony, but the effect is. I think I know that um, Hiroshima comic. Thanks to the seminal influence of comics creator Osamu Takazi, Te Tezuka, Tezuka, not Takazi. Osama's Tezuka, Japanese comics have a long, rich history of iconic characters. But in recent decades, Japanese fans also developed a taste for flashy, photorealistic art. I'm going to learn a little bit about manga. Well, this is an older book. It was from the early 2000s, but still... The resultant hybrid styles had tremendous iconic range from extremely cartoony characters to near photographic backgrounds. But Japanese comics, comics artists, took the idea a step further. Soon, some of them realized that the objectifying power of realistic art could be put up to other uses. For example... While most 
characters were designed simply to assist in reader identification, other characters were drawn more realistically in order to objectify them, emphasizing their otherness from the reader. <clears throat> A prop like this sword might be very cartoony in one sequence due to the life it possesses as an extension of my cartoon identity, but I suppose some mysterious writing carved in the word sword's hilt in Japanese comics, the sword might now become very realistic, not only to show us the details, but to make us aware of the sword as an object, something with weight, texture, and physical complexity. <coughs> In this and in other ways, comics in Japan have evolved very differently from those in the West. We'll return to these differences several times during this book. I like the masking effect, personally. And it's just one of many possible approaches to comic art. Many of my favorite artists use it very rarely. Still, I hope the Japanese perspective on cartooning helps demonstrate that one's choice of styles can have consequences far beyond the mere look of a story. As I write this, in 1992, American audiences are just beginning to realize that a simple style doesn't necessitate simple story. We're looking at mouse. A very simple story, style. Very complex. Very moving story. The platonic ideal of the cartoon may seem to omit much of the ambiguity of complex characterization, which are the hallmarks of modern literature, leaving them suitable only for children. But simple elements can comb combine in complex ways, as atoms become molecules and molecules become life. And like the atom, great power is locked in these few simple lines. At least, at least only by the reader's mind. There's a lot more to cartoons than meet the eye. realities that way wait there's more we've reduced this face to two dots and two lines is our iconic abstraction scale complete the scale shows several slightly different progressions let's concentrate on one and see if we can take it further complex to simple realistic to iconic objective to subjective specific to universal <clears throat> Can any configuration of ink on paper be more abstracted from reality, yet still represent a face as this, as clearly as this one? I say the answer is yes. Here's a part of the solution. Just draw a straight line down from each of the dots to this height for the answer. So we can draw lines. I don't know if he's going to show us. That's an E. I don't know if I can figure it out, but <laughs> without, you know, doing it. Um, F A. Oh, it is F A C E. Face. That does say face. And when you see the line drawn down, it, you can see the word face. Meaning retained, resemblance gone, words are the ultimate abstraction. Most American comics, notably comic books, have long emphasized the differences between words and pictures. Writing and drawing are seen as separate disciplines. Writers and artists are separate breeds. And good comics, as those... And good comics as those in which the combination of these very different forms of expression is thought to be harmonious. 
but just how different are they? There's words here in the faces in the word. Um, it says comics. Words, pictures, and other icons are the vocabulary of the language called comics. And here it is, comics and his, his yeah. A single language deserves a single unified vocabulary. Without it, comics will continue to limp along as the bastard child of words and pictures. Several factors have conspired against comics receiving the unified identity it needs, and among them lie some of our very best instincts. Both artist and writer begin, hands joined across the ga uh, gap with common purpose to make comics of quality. You can see this face. Um, the artist knows this means more than just stick figures and crude cartoons. He sets off in search of a higher art. The writer knows that this means more than just oof, pow, blam, and one-a-day gags. She sets off in search of something deeper. In Muslims and in, in Muslims, in museums and in libraries, the artist finds what he's looking for. He studies the techniques of the great masters of Western art. He practices day and night. She, too, finds what she is looking for in the great mysteries of Western literature. She reads and writes constantly. She searches for a voice, uniquely hers. Finally, they're ready. Both have mastered their arts. His brushstroke is nearly invisible. It is, sub it is subtlety. The fingers, pure Michelangelo. Her descriptions are dazzling. The words flow together like a Shakespearean sonnet. They read, they are ready to join hands once more and create a comics masterpiece. And we have the face, face, face. Then it's cut down. Two words and the text. And pictures are received information. We need no formal education to get the message. The message is instantaneous. Writing is perceived information. It takes time and specialized knowledge to decode the abstract symbols of language. When pictures are far more abstracted from reality, they require greater levels of perception, more like words. When words are bolder, more direct, they require lower levels of perception and are received faster, more like pictures, like that's face, received fast. Well, slower is two eyes, one nose, one mouth. And the use proud livery so gazed on now, which describes her face. Our need for a unified language of comics sends us toward the center where words and pictures are like one, are like two sides of one coin. But our need for sophistication in comics seems to lead us outward, where words and pictures are most separate. Both are worthy aspirations. Both stem from a live, for, God, uh, both stem from a love of comics and devotion to its future. Can they be reconciled? I say the answer is yes. But since the reading be, the reasons belong in a different chapter. We'll have to come back to this later. Iconic abstraction is only one form of abstraction available to comics artists. Usually, the word abstraction refers to the non-iconic varieties where no attempt is made to cling to resemblance or meaning. The type of art which often prompts the question, what does it mean? Earning the reply, it means what it is. In this case, ink on paper. This is 
This is the realm of the art object, the picture plane, where shapes, line, and colors can be themselves and not pretend to be otherwise. Below are the area described by these three ver uh, vertices, reality, language, and the picture plane, represents the total pictorial vocabulary of comics or any of the visual arts. Most comics art lies near the bottom that is along the iconic abstraction side, where every line has a meaning. Near the line, but not necessarily on it, for even the most straightforward little cartoon character has a meaningless line or two. If we incorporate language and other icons into the chart, we can begin to build a comprehensive map of the universe called comics. This is actually just crediting stuff. Uh, Mary Fleisner at her most abstract, too. You know, this is just who everybody is in here. It's really a lot to read and point out each thing, but please note this is what, this is, you know, how, how they're charting it. Um, please note artists in this chart are not necessarily chosen for artistic merit. Some very important creators are not included. So, you know, you can pick any one of these and look them up and see which one it is. I don't think that's worthy of reading, but it's very cool. Very cool chart here. A picture plane. And there they are there. I think if we tried to read that, we'd be here all night. Um, one second, I'm going to take a break. Apologize. Apologize, this chapter is a bit longer, not that much longer. Um, and I had a cat that was, he needed scratches on his head. Most of the preceding, preceding examples were based on our chart, based on the drawing styles used on Pacific characters. Each character employs a range of styles through, and many occupy several places on the chart during a given project. Some, like Matt Fiesel's Cynical Man, keep to one area consistently. A combination of extremely iconic characters and environments mixed with simple direct language and a sound effect or two would give us this. No, and that looks like you can't go in. But others range considerably from the end of the chart to the other. Excuse me. We've already discussed the range of RJ and others who contrast iconic characters with realistic backgrounds. Sound on? Okay, let's roll. Vision on? RJ stretches from left to right, from realism to cartooning. But ventures very little into the upper world of the non-iconic abstraction. Mary Fleener, on the other hand, varies only slightly in her level of iconic content, while the level of non-iconic abstraction goes nearly from top to bottom. We were just invaded. Uh, this is Kirby. Come to see him. Just some Kirby art there. I guess he wants to show us. In the mid-60s, Jack Kirby, along with Stan Lee, staked out a middle ground of iconic forms <clears throat> with a sense of the real about them, bolstered by a powerful design sense. Today... Hi, everyone. Today, many American mainstream comics still follow... Um, Kirby's lead for storytelling. But the desire for more realistic art and more elaborate scripts has pushed art and story further, apart in many cases. A fight started in, in talking here. So it's some Jim Lee art. It looks like Rogue. Um, so there's, you know, more realistic. And we've done that. Okay. <clears throat> 
In the 80s and 90s, most of the counterculture of independent creators working mostly in black and white stayed to the right of the mainstream comic art while covering a broad range of writing styles. This followed the lead of the post uh, Kurtzman generation of underground cartoonists who used cartoony styles to portray adult themes and subject matter. We'll be looking into Fat Freddy's cat for some of that soon. Ironic that the two bastions of our of cartoony art are underground and children's comics, pretty far apart as genres go. Some artists, such as the ir irrepressible Sergio Argones, staked their claim on a particular area quite long ago and have been quite happy since. Others, such as Dave McKeon, are forever on the move, experimenting, taking chances, never satisfied. When an artist is drawn um, to one end of the chart or another, that artist may be revealing something about his or her strongest values and loyalties in art. Those who approach the lower left, for example, are probably attracted by a sense of beauty of nature. Those at the top, by the beauty of art. And those on the right, by the beauty of ideas. For, a comic to for comics to matter as a medium, it must be capable of expressing each artist's innermost needs and ideas. But each artist has different inner needs and different points of view, different passions and so needs, of, and so needs to find different forms of expression. The entire history of visual arts belongs in this space Monet set up in his easel along the left face Mondrain at the top, Rembrandt lower left, Mit, uh, Matisse right above where I'm standing. And nearly every movement or manifesto planted its flag and loudly proclaimed one discovery, or proudly dis proclaimed the discovery of the only patch of ground worth building on. The 1912 essay that that comes from. And we are on the last of it, finally. Sure you're happy about that. Uh, by drawing borders around the vocabulary of comics, I hope I haven't made it seem smaller than it is. Comics artists have a universe of icons to choose from, and it's expanding all the time. Sure, ours is an increasingly symbol-oriented culture. Uh, as 21st century approaches, visual uh, iconography may finally help us realize a form of universal communication. Society is inventing new symbols regularly, just as comics artists do. Icons demanding our participation to make them work. There's no life here except that which you give it. And it's your job to recreate, to create and recreate me moment by moment, not just the cartoonists. Um, comics are very interactive. It's been over 20 years since Lewin first observed that those people growing up in the late 20th century didn't want goals so much as they wanted roles. And that's what visual iconography is all about. Smile and strong man at the beach. You know. As it happens, only two popular media were identified by Maluin as cool media. That is, medium which command audience involvement through iconic forms. One of them, television, has reached into the lives of every human being on Earth and for better or for worse, altered the course of human affairs from here till doomsday. The fate of the other one, comics, is anyone's guess. That's the end of the chapter. Chapter three is going to be blood in the gutter. Okay, well, that's uh, chapter two. We learned a little bit about the language, the icons, the imagery, you know, uh, what it is. And I hope you enjoyed. I'll be, uh, just, I hope you had a good day. Hope you enjoyed it.
Hope you learned something, and uh, we'll be reading chapter three next week. Bye, folks.